Whereas with smart, uh, smartphones. So what is the physics behind the smartphone fundus camera? As you can see that uh, the, we need a condensing liner, 28D lens or 28D lens, and the smartphone should have a flashlight. The light enters, enters the condensing lens and goes into the pupil, and the reflected ray which comes from the retina, it forms an image, real inverted image between the uh, camera lens and the condensing lens. So this is the same thing what we see with indirect ophthalmoscopy. The same, this image you will get in the right side of the, uh, of the picture, down right. The same image you will get in the fundus camera. And that is captured by our smartphone camera. So now coming to my smartphone fundus camera. This is a very simple smartphone fundus camera which can be made by everyone who knows little bit of physics. Things required, basically you need a cardboard road paper, toilet paper, UPC reducer, which is approximately six centimeter on five centimeter on four centimeter diameter, a foam tape, stapler, marker pen, microphone tape, cello tape, scale, and a 20D lens. How to make it? The first of all, you need the cardboard paper, you, you uh, the PVC reducer is stuck with a microphone tape with a cardboard paper to form, form a 16 centimeter console. That's the first step you must do. Secondly, you mark uh, with a marker pen two centimeter from the edge of the PVC reducer. And you know the foam tape is around four, four centimeter. So you stick two rounds of foam tape around the PVC, PVC reducer. So th since it is very sticky, it will, it, will, it will nicely stick around the PVC reducer. Now you mark cir circumferentially with a marker pen 0 0.5 center from the edge of the of, of the foam tape and staple it so that it will not snap out. No doubt it has all the glue and all, but still for to make it more confirm, you need to uh, staple it. Now, now this, there's a box lens. You try to insert it, it snugly fits in and come out of that PVC reducer because the size of the PVC uh, reducer uh, diameter foam tape and, and the Vox lens or any 20D lens is almost same. So this is how you use it. Just suddenly fit into the fundus uh, uh, adapter and then see it is not falling also. And you can take out. So make the patient sit comfortably in the, in the dim light with dilated fundus. Enable the smartphone in video mode. Set the flashlight on for an uninterrupted illumination. Fundus camera is held with the other hand close to the eye. Try to centrate the camera lens, 20D lens, and die in the video mode to obtain the images. Once the examination is complete, stop recording. Once you stop recording to obtain a still image from the sequence, replay the video and capture the screenshot at, at, at the desired time. And you can see the screenshots here. So the image can be cropped, stored in the gallery, or it can be transferred through WhatsApp, WhatsApp or mail. Now these are some of the uh, fundus picture where you get vitreous hemorrhage, retinal dystrophy. These are uh, stages of diabetic retinopathy. This you can see retinitis pigmentosa, the disc edema with disc hemorrhage, these CRVO, VRVO, choroiditis with CRA patches. What are the advantage of my smartphone uh, fundus camera? So this is very cost effective. You can make it in less than uh, 300 rupees. If you add everything, it will come less than 300 rupees. Easy to use, it's very easy to use with, uh, if there is a 20D lens which can suddenly fit in and you can take it out. It is portable, you can carry anywhere, where you, wherever you want. All smartphone, it, it can work with any smartphone with a flashlight and a single camera. It is very less time consuming. With practice, with little of practice, you can take the videos in two minutes. Images can be shared with WhatsApp or mail. And it can be used by optons or any health worker for diabetic screening. Disadvantages, dilated pupil of the patient is required. Alignment of the fundus camera, the smartphone camera is required. Learning curve to get a proper image. There is a learning curve where you need to get a proper image. The field of view is 50 degree. The quality of image is nowhere near professional desktop camera because there is glare, impro improper exposure and screen source. It is not suitable for smartphone with multiple cameras. Take home message, it can be used in remote areas by ophthalmologists, technicians, paramedical staff for telecommunication. 
and consultation provided there is an internet on 20 lines thank you so what is the cost sir so we can expect to prepare one single instrument of that cost of price hello, hello. No, lens, you, lens everybody has, most of the okay. people will have, but okay. anywhere, whichever adapter you buy, you need a lens. Mm -hmm. So the lens cost you can get from Amazon also around 2000, that is available. It's innovative. So and you need a single uh, camera for Yeah, correct. second camera. I am working on multiple cameras also now, so let's hope Good. in the next, I hope to show them in the next. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Next, Dr. Arvind Roy. Anybody is ready, ready, they can press it. Okay, I can just press it. Yeah. Manual press only. Shall I start, sir? Please. Yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone, respected judges. Uh, today I'll be talking about an innovative do-it-yourself manual technique of silicon oil removal versus a machine-based approach. Yes, it is a comparative study. I have no financial interest in this. So the aim is to study the efficacy of a manual silicon oil removal by a modified innovative technique as compared to a vitrectomy machine-based approach. So coming to the methodology, it's a comparative interventional case series comprising of 20 eyes. Group A had 10 eyes which went uh, underwent SOR by the That's modified okay. manual technique and group B had 10 patients which went underwent SOR by the vitrectomy based approach. The study was conducted from Jan to March 2023. All the patients posted for SOR without the need of any adjuvant procedure were included in the case series. Now coming to the classical vitrectomy based approach, you can see a small video wherein the silicone oil is being removed with a uh, extrude syringe which is connected to the vitrectomy machine. Here you can see the oil comes very slowly into the extrusion syringe of the uh, silicone oil removal and for this the image to your right shows all the equipment which is required. Basically you, you require a vitrectomy machine, the cassette, the tubings and the syringe as shown in the video. So coming to our m modified manual technique you can see the video. This is what you need is a small, uh, small sleeve which is connected to a 5C syringe. This is what is required. Then the rest of it as an equipment wise, the rest, the ports are being made. The saline is uh, connected to the bottle which is connected to the saline, IV saline stand. And the infusion from the line goes into the eye via an infusion line. And now you can see the manual technique which we modified. So here the oil comes very quickly into the cannula and rest oil bubbles are removed with uh, flush and uh, indirect is done to see the fundus and partial fluid air exchange is done with the help of a air connected to, to the infusion line and the fluid is removed through the uh, flute needle. So in this technique we hardly need anything, we, we are not dependent upon the machines and the ports might be sutured if they are leaking. So the time taken for coming to the methodology, time taken for uh, SOR in both the techniques is noted along with any adverse events. The patients were examined on post-op day one, one week and one month. On follow-up, the BCVA, IOP, the status of the retina and any other complications in either of the procedures were noted. So these are the results of our manual technique from one to 10. First row shows the time taken for the SOR, any adverse events, the best corrected visual acuity at one month, IOP at one month and uh, retina status which remains attached. These are the results in our vitrectomy based approach. So the average age of our patients in the study was 49 plus or minus 4 years, 9 were male, 11 were female. 
their preoperative BCV range from hand movement to 618. All the patients had 1500 centistoke silicon oil. So the important point here is the mean time taken for our SOR by our modified innovative technique was 1.92 minutes, whereas in the machine-based approach it was 5.20 minutes. And the post-operative visual equity ranged from 160 to 618. There were no intraoperative or post-operative complications in either of the techniques. Now coming to the discussion, earlier silicon oil removal was done passively via sclerotomies, but later on it evolved. Uh, Capron et al. has divided 25 gauge micro cannula, which is a machine based approach. But later on, in other uh, uh, publications uh, done by Zhang et al. and Zing, uh, Z uh, Zonglin et al., they've used a machine independent technique where they used a 10 cc syringe, which, are which is used to remove the 5000 centistokes oil, which has been the plunger is lifted and the it is clamped by an assistant. So, coming to what we have done is the 10 cc syringe, according to them, it generates, when you lift up the plunger to around 5 ml mark, it generates 676 mm of HG. This is more than the vitrectomy based approach. So we have modified it. We actually did it with a 5 cc syringe with a short stock, wherein the amount of pressure we apply depends upon our force with what we do. So this slide. Everybody talks about carbon neutrality, everybody, everything is machine based nowadays. So what we try to do is to reduce everything and uh, add our thing to the carbon neutrality. So to conclude, ours is a modified uh, do-it-yourself innovative technique for SOR, which is economical, safe, time efficient, and environmentally friendly. And one more thing is the technique may be used to perform SOR in ophthalmic institutions that are devoid of a vitrectomation setup also. Thank you. Is there any questions? Sir, now we are using 10 ml or 5 ml insert? 5 ml, sir. 5 ml. Sir, 4.5 ml is the upper limit sir, of Sir, what they did was with a 10 cc syringe when they lifted it up to around 5 ml mark. So, and they clamped it. So, what we saw was when we are clamping that, they told they'll see the bubble and take off that. But when the suction is there, suddenly the eye is collapsing. In that, they clamp it. They pull up the syringe and they clamp it so that it, it generates a suction effect. But in that we are seeing, even they told that we have to see the IOP because when you start pulling and clamping it, there is already a suction which is generated there. Suddenly the eye collapses. So there might be complication. In our technique, there's nothing. We hardly, we, we pull it up manually. So if we are seeing something, just release it gently. So pull it more, leave it. So in this way we can titrate the amount of pressure which is generated, the suction is what I'm talking sir. So we are using uh, five, 5 ml syringe, around 3 ml is what we, 2 to 3 ml and if we are seeing, we continuously see the oil bubble, the IOP and modify it accordingly. And it is very, very fast sir. Your vitrectomy, the setup, everything, nothing is required. We have seen that if you have a good fundus examination, like if you've seen your retina is very, very well attached, you have complications like uh, increased IOP, you want to do an emergency SOR, you don't have a machine. So you just have, a, uh, vitrectomy a machine is not at all required, sir. We just need two cannulas, infusion, and one flute needle. Very innovative, sir. Sir. Thank you, sir. No, sir, actually, that the reason for this presentation was that, sir, when we tried to talk to my colleagues, my Rotina colleagues, nobody was, it's, it is not commonly been practiced, sir. The intention of this presentation was that only, sir, to tell people that there are there is a technique, like, this is a simple technique, there's nothing much required for this. So it is not being that much followed, sir, but maybe the intention is to tell our colleagues, everybody, to follow that because this is effective. Sir, uh, there are things which they have done, sir. There are two Chinese authors or two papers on that, but they are slightly different. They have done it before, but in their studies, when we go, uh, go through the full paper, they have used vitrectomy machine for adjuvant procedures. In ours, there is no vitrectomy machine set up at all, which we are doing everything based on manually and no machine, sir. I told. Ma'am, 
because the suction you generate is within your hand. You pull the plunger of the syringe. So we don't know how much uh, vacuum is created, right? Exactly, ma'am. That's what we, the earlier paper suggests that when you, in a 10 cc syringe, when you pull it up to 4.5 mark mm. and clamp it, they've already calculated the amount of suction that is generated is 676. So in a vitrectomy machine setup, the amount of suction which is caused by the oil syringe cannula, you see it on screen. So the maximum in at least the machine which we use, it is 600. So according to the clamp based technique, what they did earlier, it is even more. So though they told that this is more, you have to carefully look at the suction is what they did in this paper. So in this, everything is manual. Nobody is clamping. So until you release uh, the clamp or move the syringe from the suction thing, it, it stays stuck. Here in this, you pull, if you see the IOP falling down, you just leave it. No, actually what ma Madam was asking, is it uh, having control regarding yeah, the exactly suction? Exactly, sir. Unlike, unlike the, see the machines, you see manually you cannot say that there is control over sir, the uh, suction. That's sir, what that's what exactly, asking. sir. When you pull up the thing, there is at one point you hold it. Sir, actually, yes, we've been doing it, so I thought. Oh, when that's okay. It's like, you know, this is an innovative procedure. What I mean to say is in the machine, like, you know, the intraoperative operative pressure, everything is, you know, documented, quantified. True, Here, true, ma'am. It's not quantified. That's what, that's my doubt. It's a good technique. There's no doubt. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. If anybody is ready with the presentation, please. Arvind Roy, Dr. Arvind Roy, Dr. Sudhakar Nayadu. Yeah, you are Sudhakar Nayadu. So we cannot go ahead with this, uh, the uh, uh, list, whoever is there with their presentation. One by one, you can come That's over here and then you can present. Shall I start? Yeah, yeah. Good morning to all. I am Dr. Sudhakar. I am going to present a role of anti-segment OCT in diagnosing deep fungal keratitis with intact corneal epithelium. The scope of mm. this talk is background, uh, brief background about uh, fungal corneal ulcers and the role of anti-segment OCT and a uh, brief review of our study and clinical relevance of this study in practice. Introduction, Inter infectious keratitis is one of the important causes of corneal blindness in our country, especially in rural populations. And uh, there are many kinds of pathogens uh, causes the corneal uh, infections, but they present in different ways. So uh, for effective treatment, early and rapid diagnosis is very important. Uh, Traditionally, smears and cultures are used for the diagnosis of the corneal infections, but however, these tests are invasive and cannot be performed in deep-seated infections with intact corneal epithelium, where uh, it's difficult to obtain the material for uh, smears and cultures. In recent years, uh, endothelial plaques caused by infectious keratitis have gradually attracted, attracted the attention uh, uh, in case of intact corneal epithelium. So uh, normally endothelial plaque is a characteristic sign of uh, fungal keratitis, but bacterial keratitis can also exhibit the plaque so because of accumulation of the fibrinous material beneath the endothelium. And so uh, in cases, uh, corneal edema obscures the corneal, endothe uh, corneal endothelial plaque, so it's difficult to distinguish different types of keratitis by slit lamp examination. So in deep-seated keratitis with the plaques, uh, corneal scraping cannot be performed as material is inaccessible in such cases. It is important to find the other examination methods to observe the plaques. So coming to our study, it's a prospective observational case study uh, conducted at Wizentry Eye Hospital from December 2020 to August 2023. In total, four cases were included in this study, having endothelial plaque with intact corneal epithelium. In such cases, uh, we cannot obtain the smears. Uh, so ASOCT with cornea module attached to the cornea cross line mode is used to evaluate the boundary between the endothelial plaque and the corneal endothelium. Uh, uh, results uh, among the four cases, uh, three are males and one is female, and uh, three had injury with vegetative matter, and one case had fall of unknown foreign body. And three cases had finally undergone therapeutic penetrating keratoplasty. One case uh, healed successfully with uh, targeted therapy with intrastomal varicone zone. And, uh, 
In all four cases, so AS OCT shows unclear wavy border between the corneal endothelium and the endothelial plug. This is the AS OCT pictures and clinical pictures showing. Picture we can clearly see the wavy border in fungal corneal ulcers. In other cases, uh, like bacterial or other infectious cases, we can see the uh, clear border, not like a wavy border. So coming to conclusion, uh, fungal keratitis, the epithelial uh, endothelial plaque develops because of immune reaction to the penetrating fungal hyphae. So in ASO city, the boundary between the corneal endothelium and endothelial plaque is unclear and wavy. Uh, coming to clinical relevance, uh, ASO city is a non-invasive diagnostic tool to detect the border between the endothelial plaque and the corneal endothelium so that we can uh, diagnose and differentiate uh, uh, fungal keratitis from other infective keratitis. Uh, it will helpful in timely treatment, uh, especially in case of deep-seated fungal ulcers with intact corneal epithelium, where uh, the, it's difficult to obtain the material for smear and culture. Thank you. So the total number of cases is four? Four, sir. And how many of them are fungal? Uh, for all four are fungus only, sir. So and only mainly we are studying in fungal keratitis cases, sir. Even bacterial also we included. But bacterial keratitis cases, so we have clear borders we have seen, sir. Mm. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yes, any other uh, present, please? So good morning everyone, good morning to all the judges here on the dais and good morning to all the participants. Thank you. So I'm Dr. Bhavik Panchal and I'll be presenting an analysis of the penetrating ocular injuries with intraocular foreign bodies to understand the variation in the clinical manifestations and the outcomes. Uh, there's no financial interest in this presentation. Just a brief background, eye injuries with retained intraocular foreign bodies basically remains one of the most important causes for vision imp impairment across all the ages. Okay, and incidence of intraocular foreign body related injury accounted from 6% to even as up to 45% amongst patients with open globe injuries. So the purpose of our study was to study the various patterns and outcomes of penetrating ocular injuries with intraocular foreign bodies alone. And a study aims to explore the distribution of final vision compared to the ocular trauma score. It was a retrospective study and the study duration period was from January 2017 to December 2022. This included all patients who had an intraocular foreign body present. Coming to the statistical analysis, a categorical data was described by percentages, whereas the continuous data by mean, median, and wherever it was appropriate. The Snellens visual acuity was converted to logmar, right, where certain values like 2.3 for hand movements, 2.7 for light perception, and three was for no light perception. Eventually, a multivariate logistic regression analysis was uh, performed to explore factors which are associated with poor vision outcome. That is an out and vision that is less than 2400. Uh, don't worry, I'll finish before six minutes. So the statistical analysis is uh, poor vision outcome was determined as vision worse than 2400 as I explained. Based on their size, the entry wounds are divided into two categories which is less than three millimeters and three millimeters and larger than three millimeters. So we used the starter software for this uh, statistical analysis and p-value of less than 0 0.05 was considered to be statistically significant. Coming to our results, 116 patients with open globe injuries with an intraocular foreign body were analyzed. The mean age of these patients was 33.8, whereas the range was from six to 75 years of age. And the mean standard deviation was uh, for the follow-up mean was 12.1 months. So we had, uh, had an average of one year follow-up for these patients. Uh, males were predominant. If you see, as, as, as much as 94% of the population was males. And uh, a similar distribution between the age groups was noted. So if you look at the percentage of patients with intraocular foreign body, <coughs> majority of the patients were in the age group 31 to 60. That is around 50% of the patients. And as I mentioned, only 94% of the patients were females. 
were males. So out of which a uh, majority of them were in the age group 31 to 60. For the pediatric age group, around 14 patients fell in the pediatric age group. And the elderly age group, only five. So it was a working class population which presented to us with an open globe injury. If you look at the activities which involved with intraocular foreign bodies post open globe injury, the most common was hammering, that is a hammering and chiseling type of injury, around 33%, followed by work at construction, carpentry or repairing. And the next percentage was of bystander injury and playing. So again, if we categorize them, the proportion of patients with intraocular foreign body by age group and related activities, uh, playing was a more, while injury while playing was the most common form in the pediatric age group, whereas hammering, it was the age group 31 to 60, same construction carpentry repairing, that is injuries at workplace. So this explains that the safety, if we provide safety glasses, this all can be prevented. Right. So majority of the patients presented to us in the later half of the week. So we had more patients in Thursday, Friday, Saturday compared to the first half of the week. Most common occupation was that of a coolie or a manual lab laborer followed by student. Median interval between injury and presentation was two days. And the most common intraocular foreign body was metallic foreign body with size of three to six mm was the most common size of foreign body noted. Corneal injury was the most common with foreign body in the anti segment. Again, 63% was metallic foreign body. Only 5%, six cases had wood as the foreign body. The mean OTS score was 56.3 prior to injury. Between both the eyes, there was no difference between both the eyes. I mean, the interval between presentation and the surgery was four and a half days. So the patient presented within two days of injury and between surgery and the presentation and surgery, it was uh, around 4.5 days time. Uh, mean presenting visual acuity was 2.69 and there was an improvement in the visual acuity of 1.3. Uh, just to understand the complications and mycological profile, uh, 13 patients developed endophthalmitis or panophthalmitis out of which 10 went into thysis bulbi, 4 were eviscerated and 1 developed sympathetic ophthalmia. The, if you look at the microbiological profile, 11 patients developed, had infection due to gram-positive bacilli and 4 had fungus and 6 had gram-negative bacilli. Again, a busy table just to explain the, from the multivariate analysis, presenting visual acuity and endophthalmitis are the two most important factors which led to poor visual acuity less than 2400. So majority of individuals were young males compared to the literature which showed uh, older age group. Incidence of eye injuries, especially those with foreign body, can be reduced by following the safety recommendations I explained. Education regarding a safe distance from areas with potentially hazardous activities <coughs> should be emphasized. Okay, and safety pitfalls should be reviewed to enhance the effectiveness of eye injuries. Significant predictors in the implicated are initial visual acuity presentation, wound size, retinal detachment, endophthalmitis. The one limitation is the ret retrospective nature of this study and long-term ocular complication could not be estimated as the patient were referred back to the primary physicians. Last slide on conclusion. This study reported a predominance of working males and hammering activities as a major relevance of IOFB injury. Overall, for visual estimation, the highly predictive value of OTS were indicated in IOFP-related open globe injuries with a much higher score uh, corresponding to a poor visual outcome. Thank you so much. Sir, what was the end result of uh, sympathetic ophthalmitis case, sir? Sorry? What was the end result of the sympathetic ophthalmitis person? So, in that particular case, uh, the eye which had injury was already into thysis. The other eye developed sympathetic ophthalmia and it was a good outcome if you pick it up early because the patient was under follow-up. What would be the reason for presenting in the latter half of the week, sir? Second half of the week. <laughs> okay. It's possible, no, this is just an analysis. We even did analysis about time of presentation, whether they came in the before noon or after noon. This, they not, could not present it here, even the day, even the month as well. So we found majority of the injuries in the first, uh, between April to June, rather compared to the winter se uh, season. I don't know relevance of it, maybe you had to look further, in, but it's a good question. Okay. It was a nice presentation, Pancha. Uh, Thank you so much, sir. Uh, did you analyze the type of foreign body in yes. your uh, presentation? Because you're telling it's a retrospective study. Correct. You have, uh, have you analyzed the type of foreign body? Yes. Whether so these are metallic, non-metallic, or 
vegetative or something like yes. that. Yes, 63 percent had metallic foreign bodies. It was in the presentation as well. Wood was seen only in six cases. That is around five percent of the presentation. But it was uh, metallic was the most common here, followed by glass and then wood. I could not hear you, sir. Sorry. Is there any relation between the sympathetic ophthalmic etiology basing on the type of foreign body? Uh, not really. Uh, the thing is, sympathetic ophthalmia can present in any individual post surgery uh, or post injury as well. We cannot predict in which patient it will happen. Right. Sometimes, even with post TSCPC, also an individual can lead to go into sympathetic ophthalmia. So, type of foreign body in the literature, as such, is not mentioned which foreign body will lead to higher incidence of sympathetic ophthalmia. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I am seeing Dr. Aravind Rai here. I welcome you. Session. And if you are ready with your presentation, please. Please come. Yeah, you are. Very good afternoon to all, and thank you for the opportunity to present our work here. I am Aravind Roy. I am a cornea faculty at L.V. Prasad I Institute. So our present study deals with the human ocular surface microbiome. When we talk about microbiome, uh, what do we mean? So any body surfaces, the skin, uh, the gut, uh, or also the uh, oral or the nasal mucosa is teeming with life. Some are commensals, some are pathogenic. And there is a dynamic interplay between these organisms. And when there is disease, the upper hand is by the pathogenic organisms. And when there is health, there is the upper hand by the commensals, which are the protective bacteria. Now, we know that it has a significance in life. Is there a significance after death? Yes, probably there is. because we are seeing increasingly fungal infections in post-transplant. And this is also true because there are more lamellar surgeries, more DMEX, DSEX that is happening uh, over the last decade. And another interesting thing is that the tissue that is coming to the cornea surgeon is preserved in a solution which is like MK is the most common and also the others are like our uh, the cornisol or usol, et cetera, and they are all having antibiotics. They don't have antifungals. Whereas after COVID, the iBank Association of India changed the rules of cornea collection from not only six to eight hours, but up to 24 hours of death, provided their body has been preserved. So with increasing time, a hot, humid cavity like the conjunctival cul-de-sac is an ideal breeding ground for fungus and are we are we even understanding what colonizes the conjunctival cul-de-sac and this was the background of our present study this is a more of a basic science study and here we collected the swabs from the conjunctival the conjunctiva of the cadaveric eyes prior to collection prior to installation of povidone iodine and we analyzed it for the types of organisms that populate it so when we analyze microbiomes, there are two methods by which it can be done. Number one is the amplicon sequencing, where we target only very specific taxonomic markers, 16S, 18S, ITS, intern uh, so, and then there we understand that these signatures are very unique for, say, fungi or one particular type of fungi, and these sequences are matched to the database. The other is the metagenomic sequencing, where we read the entire genome, but that is slow and more expensive. So most studies, including our studies, performed the amplicon sequencing. Then this was the methodology of next generation sequencing. Take a swab. From the ophthalmologist's point of view, take the swabs, extract the DNA in the labs, perform a PCR amplification of the amplicon, which is the ITS2, and then match it with the library which is already existing, and identify what are the pathogenic, what are the commensals that are there. 
Then there are some quality control indices which tell us that this is, uh, for example, the alpha diversity spot, uh, plot, which, which basically means that this is a very diverse collection of organisms that are there in the samples. And in our study, we included all those suitable donors between 18 to 80 years who were refrigerated within six hours of death and the collection was performed within 24 hours of death. We excluded all the known contraindications for eye donation such as uh, septicemia, uh, drowning, then any other contraindications, exposure of the eye, road traffic accident where there is a contamination. So those were out. So we only took the healthy eyes. From there, we took the swabs prior to collecting the cornea after instilling povidone iodine. For this study, six suitable donor eyes were studied, and we performed the OTU. OTU is the, the, uh, the ocular uh, taxonomic units, meaning that uh, what are the taxonomies that are there in this microbiome? And then we assigned this to phylum and genus level. And the commonest phyla were Ascomycota and Basidiomycota. The commonest genera were Aspergillus, Blumeria, Cutaneo, uh, Trichosporum. So these were the common genera. The other fungi that we noted were Candida and Malachasia. So if we see, these are the heat maps. Basically, these bars tell us how much of each genus is present. So if we see, this is the blue colors is Aspergilla. And then we have the coletiotrichum, and we have some candida also. So predominantly there was more aspergillus after death. Species heat map distributions are, are again very similar to the genus, obviously. And just to give an overview of how this is just the microbiome of only one, one sample. And here we can see the tremendous diversity of the microbiome that is there in the eye after death. So here we see if we just, and this is just the fungal microbiome. So here we have Ascomycota and Basidiomycota in red and green. And the yellow is interesting. That means that in this sample, 29% of the fungi are unknown, unclassified. Even we do not know currently with our databases that this much of organisms are not even known to us. So that shows how important it is to understand the microbiome and understand that these can be pathogenic, these can lead to possible disease. Th that was the purpose of the current paper. And from the phylum that we found that Ascomycota was predominant, Aspergillus is commonest, but there is also good presence of Candida and Malachasia. So thank you very much for your patience. Sir, these samples were collected in less than six hours after death, sir? They were collected within 24 hours of death, provided the body was preserved in refrigeration within six hours of death. Okay, Diver, thank you. Thank you very much. What's your name? Adira, sir. Adira. Yes. Sevam, good morning to one and all. I'm Dr. Adira from Vishagaya Hospital, presenting today a rare case of retinal dystrophy with CNVM in a young child. Coming to the case history, a healthy nine-year-old male child presented with gradual painless blurring of vision in both eyes since three months and distortion of images in the right eye since one month. He also noticed difficulties while coming out of bright surroundings to the dim areas since few months. There is no history of previous eye checkup, spectacle use, diplopia or trauma. There is no significant past personal or allergic history. There is no history of night blindness in the family. All the developmental milestones attained appropriate to the age. General examination, vitals, systemic and external ocular examination were normal in both eyes. And the best collateral visual acuity was 618 in right eye with a near vision of N8. 
and in left eye it was 66 parts with a near vision of N6. The intraocular pressure was normal in both the eyes and the color vision using Ishihara starts was normal in both the eyes. The anterior segment findings of both the eyes were normal. Coming to the fundus examination right eye, we can see irregular hypopigmented lesions over the retina, sparing a part of retina above and below. And there is a yellowish white lesion over the macular area with a subretinal and intraretinal hemorrhage. Coming to the left eye, we can see irregular hypopigment areas and which is sparing a part of uh, retina above and below with a healthy foveolar reflex. So based on the clinical history and the examination findings, we came to a provisional diagnosis that it, there could be a, there is simple myopic astigmatism both eyes, probably a retinal dystrophy which could be a row dysfunction both eyes and CNVM right eye. Our differential diagnosis include best vitreiform dystrophy, congenital stationary night blindness, sorbus fundus dystrophy. So we move ahead with the investigations of autofluorescence, OCT, OCT angiography, visual feed, and ERG. So on investigation, the autofluorescence showed the similar lesions that we see in the fundus image. And in the OCT, we can see the foveal contour is distorted with a sub, with a hyperreflective foci we can see here, and we can see a subretinal hyperreflective material. So this was the findings in the OCT. Coming to the OCT angiography, we can see a hyperreflective lacy pattern, which is suggestive of a neovascular membrane. Coming to the left eye, we can see that lesions corresponds to the autofluorescence, and the OCT was normal, and OCT angiography of left eye was found to be normal. Coming to the visual feed, even after repeated doing of visual feed, we couldn't find get a reliable visual feed because it's a nine-year-old child. And coming to the ERG, we can see overall that there is a generalized depression of the amplitude, and we can see in the scotopic range, there is absent A wave in the 0 0.01 ERG, and there is a depressed amplitude of the B wave, while the, uh, both the waves are depressed in case of scotopic 3.0 ERG, and there are diminished uh, oscillatory potentials in scotopic 3.0, and photopic ERG 3.0 shows diminished amplitude, and in photopic 3.0 flicker also, we can see diminished amplitude. So this is suggestive of a combined road cone dysfunction. So our final diagnosis based on all the investigation modalities were simple myopic astigmatism both eyes, retinal dystrophy, probably the road cone dysfunction both eyes, and CNVM right eye. So clinically and on investigation, we have seen that there is an activity present. So we, have, we move ahead with the uh, plan of care to administer injection anti vegf to control CNVM bleed, to follow the patient to look for any progression of this condition and explain the prognosis of the condition and the need for multiple injections were explained. So this was the result that we have get pre and post intervention of an injection antivagef. So the lesions with the heme that we see in the investigation and the OCT angiography has disappeared in, in the first month of follow up post in intervention antivagef. And over the two months follow up also we can see there is no new lesions or activity noted. So only one injection of antivagef is sufficient. We stopped there and we are monitoring the patient every monthly, and we are actually doing the Amsterdam monitoring for the patient also. So there are literatures in which different various uh, retinal dystrophy presented with CNVM, which is treated with uh, injection anti-VEGF, anti and uh, retinal dystrophy with such an atypical presentation, we couldn't find any articles. So my take home message is, this is an atypical presentation of retinal dystrophy with road cone dysfunction. Even this atypical presentation can also be present as a CNVM. And intravitreal antivagef could be considered as a treatment option in such a scenario also. So these are my references. Thank you. What was the cost for CNVM? Ma'am, uh, the retinal dystrophy can itself resulting in the thinning of the RPA, resulting in the CNVM. One month. So she, the child is on follow-up? Yes, ma'am. So, so we have done one month follow-up and two month follow-up. The lesion was stable. There is no activity noted later. Vision was normal, sir. It was, there is no further improvement in the vision. Dr. Madhurama, ready? Are you ready? Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I am uh, Dr. Madhurima. Today, I am going to present a paper on surgical outcome 
इन पेशेंट्स विद कॉम्प्लिकेटेड कैटरेक्ट सेकेंडरी टू उटिस कैटरेक्ट इन यूवाइटिस में डेवलप एज रिजल्ट ऑफ इंट्रॉक इन्फॉर्मेशन और फ्रॉम कॉनिक कॉर्टकोस्टेड यूज द इंसिडेंट ऑफ कैटरेक्ट इन यूवाइटिस रेंजेस फ्रॉम फिफ्टी सेवन परसेंट इन पास प्लेनाइटिस टू सेवेंटी एट परसेंट इन फ्यूक्स कैटरेक्ट सर्जरी इन यूवाइटिक आई इज यूजली चैलेंजिंग टास्क दैन ए नॉन यूवाइटिक आई यूजली ड्यू टू एक्सटेंसिव पोस्टियर साइरिके स्मॉल मायोटिक प्यूपल फाइब्रोटिक एंटर कैप्सूल एंड विग जोन्यूल्स अंटिल टू डेज टू डेकेड्स एगो द आउटकम ऑफ सर्जरी इन दिस आईज वॉज गार्डेड बिकॉज ऑफ कन्फॉर्मिंग पोस्ट ऑपरेटिव कॉम्प्लिकेशन हाउ एवर विथ मॉडर्न डे कैटरेक्ट सर्जिकल टेक्निक्स इंप्रूव अंडरस्टैंडिंग ऑफ डिजीज प्रोसेस ऑप्टिमाइजेशन ऑफ इम्यूनस ऑपरेशन एंड बायो कंपेटेबल आई ओ एल्स द डिज़ाइन ऑफ आई ओ एल डिज़ाइन एंड मेटेरियल द आउटकम हैज़ बिन मैक्सीमाइज मतलब एम इन ऑब्जेक्ट ऑफ माई स्टडीज इज टू स्टडी द मॉफोलॉजिकल टाइप्स एंड डिस्ट्रीब्यूशन ऑफ वेरियस कॉम्प्लिकेट कैटरेक्ट इन यूवाइटिस टू एवेलुएट द विजल आउटकम undergoing cataract surgery for complicated cataract and traces the intraoperative and postoperative complications it is a retrospective observational study conducted over a period of 1 year in uh, arvind eye hospital tirupati the patient, inclusion criteria is the patient's age more than 12 years patients with complicated cataract following uveitis where uveitis is either inactive or under control with ac cells less than 1 plus and uh, with medication for at least 3 months before surgery Exclusion criteria is acute active uveitis case of recurrent uveitis with acute exacerbation and patients with pl negative selected patients underwent a detailed examination uh, bcva sit lab examination fundus examination and iop uh, cases with total cataract underwent b scan ultrasonography patients with visually significant cataract and quiet eyes for a period of at least 3 months were taken into the uh, study additional steps were done in case of small non dilating pupil extensive synechia and in the presence of pupillary membrane follow up was done on day 1 1 month and 3 months uh, the mean age of the uh, the mean age was observed to be 47 plus or minus 16.5 uh, the majority of the patient belonged to the age group of 61 to 70 years followed by 21 to 30 years uh, the pre of uh, visual acuity most of the patients belonged to the visual acuity of 6 by 60 to 1 by 60 females were more than males females were 56% and males were 44% Uh, majority of the patients, the 44% of the patients were for uh, total cataract. The posterior subcapsular cataract with nuclear cirrhosis was observed in 35%, and posterior subcapsular cataract with cortical cataract was observed in 21%. Uh, majority of the patients underwent small incision cataract surgery, followed by uh, phaco emulsification. A majority of the patients belonged to the anterior uveitis group, the 53.50%, followed by intermediate uveitis, pan uveitis, and then the posterior uveitis. Uh, the type of iols implanted uh, 30% of the patients were implanted with acrylic lens 5% with aspheric 9% with eye, eye vision iol 49% with pmma one patient was uh, implanted sf iol and two patients were left aphakic uh, intraoperative procedures additional were done ctr was used in one patient iridectomy in two patients pupilloplasty was done in four patients iris hooks were used in two patients capsule hooks in one patient spintrotomy in four patients sinic lysis in eight patients primary posterior capsulotomy was done in one patient and anterior vitrectomy in three patients uh, the post operative visual acuity was uh, uh, observed on day 0 day 30 and 3 months uh, the best corrected visual acuity improved to 6 to 12 or better in 72% of the patients on day 30 it improved uh, in 23.4% of patients from 618 to 636 Uh, only uh, in two patients the visual acuity improvement was not seen this was due to the pre existing post segment pathology so 43 eyes of 43 patients having complicated cataract following uveitis with visual segment cataract were taken up for the study the peak incidence of age was 61 to 70 years the most common morphological type of cataract observed was posterior subcapsular type followed by total cataract majority of the patient went incisive surgery and then phaco emulsification uh, after the cataract surgery the majority of the patients uh, in our study the post operative at 1 month correct uh, the correct distance visual acuity improved in 72% of the eyes okay the most common complication encountered uh, was uh, recurrence of uveitis in our study followed by posterior capsular opacification cystoid macular edema intraop complications observed was zonular dialysis in five patients and posterior capsular rent in three patients uh, conclusion is there was this is there was a statically significant improvement in visual outcome 
after cataract surgery in complicated cataract secondary to uveitis. The use of pupil dialytic techniques like iris hook sphincterotomy was helpful in making an adequate size capsule excess and thereby reducing the post-operative complication. The most important predictor for successful cataract surgery in our study was meticulous control of preoperative inflammation followed by regular follow-up after cataract surgery. Thank you. Is there any difference in the results between PMMA lens and the acrylic lens uh, implanted breast? Sir, actually here in this study we have not uh, done that, but actually in the acrylic lens it was relatively better than the PMMA lens. The complication rate was relatively less in acrylic because uh, phacom verification was done. So cystoid macular edema was observed less, uh, but that was not done in this uh, study. So sorry, sir, I'm not Dr. Vishnupriya, Dr. Vishnupriya, so can you wait for 30 days? See, uh, the next, uh, I mean, following first post-operative day, again, you said that, we, I mean, you have seen the case uh, after 30 days. So can you wait for 30 days in between without seeing the patient okay. in a case of a complicated cataract? It's, it's actually to follow, right. it's better to follow up even on day one, day 15, and then day 30. So after two weeks also, we have to see because there may be increase in uh, your inflammation, sir. Yes, sir, we have done on 30-day follow-up because in our institute, most of the patients are from very uh, far away. So the follow-up is uh, really difficult in our institute, so. Yes, sir. Please switch on the mic, switch on the mic. Go yeah, close to the mic. Cases, you are not supposed to put the IOL. Yes, you have not mentioned that. And uh, you have mentioned that the AC anterior chamber has to be quiet. So how much quiet it has to be? Less than, uh, AC cells less than plus one. Yeah. And uh, post-operatively, uh, you have mentioned a lot of recurrence in uveitis. What was the reason for that? Sorry, ma'am, reasons for? Post-operatively in complications, you have mentioned recurrence of uveitis. What was the reason for that? There was... Uh, Intense inflammation, ma'am, uh, after, uh, at day 30, it was observed. Inflammation was observed, ma'am. Recurrence of uveitis was observed. So uh, in our study, it was because of uh, the patient uh, in compliance with the, one who's not compliant with the treatment, ma'am. The usage of steroid drops were not uh, correct. We have tapered it over three months, but few patients have not used it properly. So most of, it was observed that because of the non-compliance to treatment, uh, there was a recurrence of uveitis. Yes, sir. 